This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. My guest today is David Clayton. David is an artist, he's a painter and iconographer, he's also a writer and the provost at Pontifex University, where he runs a graduate program in sacred art. He's the author of a number of books, including The Way of Beauty, The Little Oratory, and The Vision for You, and more. David grew up in England, and he studied material physics at Oxford become, before becoming a full-time artist and teacher. So we did this interview a while ago, but you can find some of his latest work at thewayofbeauty.com, his podcast, The Way of Beauty. Uh, and I have notes and links to all this in the show notes at themoralimagination.com. So in this episode, we discuss the nature of beauty. What is beauty? Does it have an objective character or is it merely subjective and in the eye of the beholder? We talk about how we experience beauty. How do we communicate it to others? We discuss the role of consensus and tradition, classical art, contemporary gallery art, popular and folk art, sacred liturgy, and decorative art, and more. We discuss some of the key characteristics of beauty, including integrity, harmony, proportion, and clarity and the connection to mathematics and the cosmos. So David explains musical octaves and ratios and how these relate and are manifested in architecture and the sacred liturgy. We also talk about the relationship between art and morality. We have a little discussion about good and bad art and how to learn and create art that speaks to our times. So we discuss a number of thinkers, including Aristotle, Augustine and Boethius on beauty and number, Thomas Aquinas, Roger Scruton, Dietrich von Hildebrand, and St. Bonaventure and his idea of semiotic metaphysics. So uh, related to that, I'm just starting to work on a project that I'll be telling you about more in the coming weeks and months. Uh, the working title is Reframe. But last year, I saw a post where someone wrote about some key ideas that shaped his thinking, things like the Pareto Principle or Parkinson's Law and things like that. And a lot of those, of course, are, are very interesting and influential. But I started thinking, what are some of the key ideas that have shaped my thinking and my life, uh, more foundational ones? And so one afternoon I sat down and I wrote down about 40 or so on index cards. And so I've been thinking about this uh, for a while and talking to some people about it. And so in the next coming months, I'll be distilling them down to about 25 or so that I'm calling reframe these 25 ideas for life that help us to see the world as it is. So I'm bringing this up uh, because some of the ideas that we talk about in this podcast, namely that beauty is objective, but that we experience it subjectively. Also, the idea of semiotic metaphysics, that things are things in themselves, but they're also signs uh, pointing. These are some of these ideas that I think are part of these key foundational reframe ideas. So I'll be writing about these things in the coming months and hope to have a couple of podcast episodes that address them as well. I'll have more updates coming. If you want to be included in these, you can write me an email or sign up for updates at www.michaelmathesonmiller.com. I'm also building a new website for the Moral Imagination podcast. Uh, so I have one now, but I'm adding some more things where you'll be able to subscribe to newsletter, get some more updates, additional content. So I'll let you know when that comes out as well. So thanks to all of those who have written reviews and shared uh, the podcast. If you like the podcast and you have not yet written a review, please do. It does really help grow the podcast. Thanks to those who've supported the podcast through Patreon. I'm grateful. It helps pay with the expenses for doing this. And if you like the podcast and you'd like to support it, you can go to themoralimagination.com where you'll find a link to Patreon. And also for every episode, I put up show notes, resources, essays, links to books that we discuss and more. So again, please feel free to write me at michael at michaelmathesmiller.com with any suggestion of people or topics that you'd like me to address. Thank you again for sharing and for listening. And I hope you enjoy my podcast with David Clayton on beauty and art. David, welcome to the podcast. Pleasure to be here, Michael. Thanks again for joining. Um, why don't, before we start, let's uh, do a little bit. So your your background, you also, I mean, you're an artist, right? We talked about that. You're, yeah. you're also a mathematician, is that right? I studied physics. or, or the, the, It was uh, material science, which is the physics of solids at Oxford. So I've got quite a strong background in mathematical science, yes. So before we get to some of the content, the beauty and, and art that I want to talk to you about, how did you go from physics and material sciences into being uh, an artist and iconographer uh, and all this work that you do in, in beauty? How did that transition take place? I'd always enjoyed painting and, and in fact, have been discouraged from uh, following it at, at school. And uh, so it's always been something I did on the side. And the, I would say that I was at the level where my mum always told me I was very good. So that was good enough for me, <laughs> uh, but not much beyond that. 
Um, and uh, when I was in my mid-20s, I had a huge shift in my life. I converted to Catholicism. I developed a faith in God. And there was somebody who was influential in my, in my conversion uh, who encouraged me to start doing what I really wanted to do, and that was paint. Uh, he asked, so this actually was, I wrote about this in the, my, my book, The Vision for You. Just That's, your, that's your newest you. book, yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah I started reading that. Um, and it really was just uh, about how he convinced me that I could have a good life, have a happy life, <laughs> and that doing what you want to do you know, is something that uh, you can, is, is a possibility. And so he asked me a question, how do you, uh, what would you do if um, you inherited so much money that you just uh, you could choose to do whatever you wanted to do, nine to five, five days a week? And I said, paint. And he said, OK, that's what you should be doing. And uh, he then told me how to go about it and gave me the confidence to believe that it might happen. Now, uh, the foundation of this is a faith in God and the idea of a personal vocation. There is a uh, there is a very uh, sensible approach to this. You don't just burn your bridges and go for it. Uh, although I was a bit of a worry to my parents, I think, at the time. <laughs> um, but that's that's how I started to pursue it. And also linked to my conversion, um, I, I was wandering into a church called the Brompton Oratory in mm-hmm. London, which had beautiful liturgy. You wouldn't say it was the most beautiful or striking art or architecture. It's a sort of Victorian neo-Baroque church. I mean, it's it's wonderful in comparison to most of the churches built today. But uh, what it does have, what it does have, is art and architecture which is connected to the liturgy. And I remember just seeing all of this working together, and wondering why we couldn't have this in every church in the country. Um, and so then I became not only interested in being a painter, but uh, painting sacred art and then trying to understand the foundations of it and what what forms it. Is it just personal opinion or are there some traditions which can guide us uh, to produce this harmony of form and function, if you could call it that? Great. Well, I want to talk to you about, about that, the objective nature of beauty and also about sacred liturgy, uh, which you and I have discussed about before. Well, let's let's move to the questions of art and beauty. Uh, why don't, you know, so I talk a lot about the moral imagination. And one of the things I say, you know, there's a number of things with the moral imagination that I think we need to recover. Uh, and so things like we need to expand our concept of rationality beyond the empirical. Um, we need to take seriously truth. We need to take seriously the importance of language. Um, uh, one of the things we need to do I think is to read very good stories and there's a number of good books on, on reading good stories and on the importance of fairy tales, uh, that I, that I address, but, um, uh, and some others include like cultivating silence to going outside. But one of the things that I think is important, and it's also hard for people to get is this idea that we need to recover objective beauty. And I also make a connection, David, between recovering objective beauty and and also affirming the subjective dimension of the human person, which relates a little bit to what you're talking about, that each of yeah. us is a unique, unrepeatable individual. So this is one way I, I, I explain it uh, in brief. I say, well, I think we've taken this sublime truth that each of us is a unique, unrepeatable individual and that we come to, say, a work of art or a landscape or a piece of music and with all of our own hopes and dreams and fears and wants, uh, with our own experiences and joys and sadness and confusion. And we get something out of what I would say is an objective experience of beauty or ugliness perhaps, but let's talk about beauty for now. And then we're moved by it. And now we have the ability to communicate that to someone else. And we've taken that sublime experience and we've reduced it to this very banal, well, like everybody's got their own opinion. Beauty's only in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you're not actually talking about something. It's just your own feelings. And I think that that doesn't do justice to the, the intrinsic value of the beautiful thing. And I don't think it does justice to our own personal subjectivity because if we're not actually talking about something, well, who cares what you think or feel? Right, so I think it actually, in this desire to maybe either to affirm the self, we actually uh, diminish the self, and we miss something 
fundamentally true about existence. So a, a lot of people, I think, can start, to, okay, I can start to see that. I mean, we're pretty much indoctrinated with the idea that beauty is simply um, a subjective. Uh, but even if they start to see it, okay, well, maybe that's the case, but how would I possibly articulate or understand the objective nature of beauty? So maybe you could help us think through how, how do we articulate that beauty is actually not merely subjective, but has objective quality? And then what are some of the attributes of objectivity that we could articulate? Does that make sense, that question? Yes, it does. Um, so I agree with you, first of all, that, that at the root of this is a, a, um, a difference of the understanding of the nature of existence. So the, the first assumption that we're making is that when I'm looking out of the window and I'm looking at the trees outside, that they exist. That, that I'm responding to something that really is. Um, and furthermore, it's not, not simply even um, a collection of atoms. That's why when I look at the sky, the hills, the trees, they are entities which have meaning. They're, they're not, it's not just simply a random collection of atoms that uh, I'm assigning meaning to, that, that there is an entity which has a, a, a genuine meaning. Um, and so in philosophical terms, you can talk of a substance, for example, something that, that really does have a cohesive principle that underlies it. And then, and sorry, so, and so like, uh, just philosophically, the nominalist yeah. would, would disagree, right? The nominalist yes. position would say, no, it's just a collection of, of atoms, or how, is use your language, that I'm assigning a name to. But you're yeah. saying, no, actually, that tree that you see is, um, an intel is, is intelligible to our intellect and, and, and has some meaning or significance in itself. In itself, as a tree. As yes. a tree, yeah. Okay. As a tree. Okay, keep going. Um, and so once you believe that, then uh, historically what would happen, it would be recognized that we respond differently to different things around us. And so in the, a broad generalization would be that pretty much everybody looks at the beauty of nature and, or looks at nature and believes it's beautiful, that there's very few who dissent from that, that principle. And so assuming, therefore, that nature exists and the cosmos exists, uh, the, the question is, well, what is it we're responding to? And so you analyze the properties of what it is you're looking at or you're responding to, um, and you, you associate certain common principles be, between those things that most people say uh, are beautiful. And it does begin with this consensus. Uh, and one of the, uh, the, the, the big problems with the, the principle of objective beauty that people believe to be a problem is that they will then point to different opinions. They'll say there's a huge diversity of opinion. Well, I actually, I would rather start and say, well, there's more conformity of opinion than you think. Look at nature. If we look at um, the thousands of people who, who go to cities like Oxford, which I love, or the, um, Florence, for example, um, it isn't just a random distribution of people visiting cities of tourists. They tend to go to certain places. And, and, and I would suggest to you that if you ask them why they go, they say it's a beautiful place. So you start with that consensus. Now, having said that, that isn't the full story, as you, as you said. There clearly are different responses. I prefer Oxford to Florence, and a lot of people will be horrified by that. Um, and so there is a subjective element. We're going to delete that part, okay, just so nobody hears that. We're going to delete that whole part about Florence. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, I'll okay. keep that secret. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Keep going. So there's a subjective <laughs> part. Well, yeah, I didn't mention Cambridge, of course, a lot of people, but we won't, we won't get into that. So um, there is a subjective element there. Um, people respond to things differently. Not all of us um, are capable of recognizing beauty in the same way. Now, therefore, I'm not saying that I'm the one who can and you're the one who can't. When I say that, that's what people hear. You're telling me I have to accept your version of what is beautiful. And we can't. So there is no ultimate arbiter of what is of what is beautiful. We have to look at consensus over centuries, and you call that tradition. But the differing responses have to be acknowledged. And the best, and that there are two analogies to this that that I found 
that allow for that subjectivity uh, without denying the objectivity. One is food. Um, it's like good food. Um, everybody loves ice cream, <laughs> but no one would say it's good food. Um, and people have different tastes. And we can distinguish between something that is just a personal preference and the idea that there is something intrinsically good about it. Um, but nobody believes that there isn't something intrinsically good about food that nourishes you. And we can, we can uh, recognize that uh, the objective qualities of the food and the nutritional value, shall we say. Another one is if you just look at the scientific analysis of, um, of the world around us, that um, over the years, scientists have said a lot of different things about the nature of the cosmos and the nature of the, the universe. Um, and uh, they're continually revising their theories. And, and the assumption behind science is that there is something within the object they're analyzing that is true. Yet they revise their hypotheses continually. Um, and no one suggests that's because it's a, science is just a subjective discipline. It's because the level of understanding and the ability to analyze of the scientists develop, the field, the field of science develops. And so um, that's, what, that's what goes on. There, there are, uh, we, we do respond differently, um, depending on, as you described, on our emotional, uh, emotional states, for example. Uh, we can respond differently. The same person, person can have a different response to the same object at different times, depending upon mood. Um, but none of this, none of this uh, negates the idea that there is something intrinsically good about the object that we're looking at. And when we see that good and we take delight in it, then we recognize it as beautiful. Okay, you know, there's a, a philosopher, Dietrich von Hildebrand, who, I don't know if you've read von Hildebrand, he makes um, an interesting distinction that's similar to what you said. He, he says that, he says that when you look at things or experience something, there's three kinds of experiences that we call what he calls subjectively satisfying, right? So ice cream or an Oreo, yeah. the genuinely beneficial, which would be maybe kale salad, which you may or may not find, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, genuinely, I mean, sorry, subjectively satisfying, um, or, you know, it's taking medicine or something like that, which is, good for you need it it's genuinely beneficial but it's not subjectively satisfying and then that which has intrinsic value and so this is things like human persons right but also he would say beautiful works of art nature etc that have intrinsic value and that he says that we respond to those things with intrinsic value in a different way than we respond to the subjectively satisfying but he also says that in fact if we respond to something that's intrinsically valuable merely as if it's subjectively satisfying then he would say that's actually an incorrect response to the thing it doesn't mean that you can't take subjective satisfaction out of it but if you reduce it to that if you simply appropriate it as opposed to like you would an oreo or ice cream as as opposed to say um a beautiful work of art which you don't simply appropriate but that you uh you you respect you approach with a sense of of humility and reverence so that you, you know, that it, it impresses itself upon you. He he makes that distinction. Do you think that's helpful? Yes, I I, I do. I think that um, the in the sort of perfectly ordered person, all of these things are just in harmony. You know, we see uh, that there's different. Uh, we have a deep satisfaction, a deep recognition of the intrinsic value of things, and we delight in them at a deep level and at a superficial level. Um, and um, th the other thing is that uh, superficial pleasure, I think, is under underplayed. You know, it's shallowness has a place in relation to depth. If, if everything's deep and meaningful, mm -hmm. then there's no frivolity. And we, we need both, I think. So let's, let's now, so let's go, so we've, we've talked a little bit about how the subjective experience of beauty, which is real, doesn't negate the objectivity or doesn't negate objectivity in beauty. And people may come to people. I think, I think people can see that to a bit. I mean, there are some, maybe some materialists or, or it can be hardcore nominalists who might reject it. And, and we can go into that later if, if you want, but what about, but 
how, how do we understand beauty? So one of the things, like I think it's Aquinas talks about integrity, harmony, yes. and proportion, radiance. Like what makes something beautiful? And, and I'll say one other thing. I remember I was talking to, um, we were over at some friend's house and um, they they had a, 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 one of their children was in high school. She's in college now. And we had a, a question about beauty. And at the end, it became kind of, she she began to agree. Okay, I think objective beauty exists. Uh, and then she was frustrated because we couldn't come to like a, a immediate resolution of it. And and I said, well, one, I don't think there's an immediate resolution, as you already said. But also, I said, look, this is why it's such an interesting subject, right? But to think about it, all this debate, all this interesting debate we could have, trying to wrestle with things, trying to understand things, um, it doesn't matter if it's merely subjective, right? And so part of actually the joy is the complexity. And I think a lot of times people find, oh, it's complex. I can't really articulate it. Therefore, it must be you know, just an opinion. Uh, so maybe let's try to articulate what are some of the things that distinguish beauty from mediocrity or ugliness. And I know you give some examples in architecture with harmony and proportion and size. Uh, could you maybe help us think through what, what, what are we looking for? What makes something beautiful that this in a sense, broad consensus across cultures tells us. Okay, so we're assuming we have um, we have this consensus and that we've done this analysis. So that's where Aristotle, for example, would start. And then what you start- so Maybe for just at, one second, sorry, yeah. just one second for clear. So let, the consent, let's make, let's make it a little bit clear what the consensus is. Just, yeah. I, I mean, I-, I I've read your thing, so I, I think I understand what you're saying. But you're, you're, if I understand you, consensus is that generally across cultures, there's a consensus that certain things are in harmony and certain things aren't. And I think one of the examples you give is the, the musical octave. Maybe, yeah. maybe just a, a quick summary of what we mean by consensus so that the listener doesn't think, well, oh, people disagree all the time. There's, there's not consensus about anything. Maybe, maybe define that kind of basic level of consensus and then we'll go to Aristotle. Yes. Uh, the, uh, what, the, the question, the, the difficulty is that, um, that even though we say there's objective truth, um, there is this subjective element and so the question then is, well, when there is a difference of opinion, who's right and who's wrong? And there are no, unlike morality, for example, there are no Ten Commandments of beauty. There is no way in which you can prove that something is beautiful um, definitively. Just, and, but just because we can't say prove it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, for example. Now, um, so the best guide you have actually is the human response. And that's what beauty is. It's a, it's a response in delight at the goodness of something which is perceived. And so the, the best place to start is to look at things that most people over an extended period of time find beautiful and then analyze them. And so um, you can have the vagaries of fashion. Anything can be uh, promoted to death. And people will respond to it, and there can be novelty. But uh, the the best indicator is that many people over an extended period of time say that it's beautiful, and that's the best that we have. Um, and Chesterton referred to the democracy of the dead, and this is something that recognizes the the value of the past and of tradition, um, as well as current uh, opinions. Um, and so you start with something. If you wanted to analyze it, you start with those things for which there is least contention. Um, so the patterns in nature might be a good starting point, or uh, uh, the examples that you described, the musical octaves, so, uh, or the musical musical harmonies. So even then, in different cultures, there are there are different harmonies which sound beautiful. And in Western culture, over time, we've ad adapted to different harmonic forms. But nevertheless, I think that there are some fundamental starting points that we can look to, one being the octave, that if you hear a, a middle C and then you play eight notes in a scale and you hear the C um, an octave higher, people hear that connection. It, it, it sound, they sound together. They sound, even though it's higher in tone, one has the same quality as the other. And so uh, they, they would say we're recognizing this connection between it. 
And within a, a musical scale, you can play the fourth note and the fifth note, and all going all the way back to Pythagoras in the ancient Greeks. Uh, the, you can see people hear these connections generally. Um, so then what you do is you analyze those mathematically. And if you, if you have lengths of string, for example, and you pluck the note, you can fret it on a, a violin or a guitar. You look at the lengths of string that produce those notes, and you find there's a ratio of lengths, or organ pipes would be the same thing. So the, the octave is one to two. Uh, the perfect fifth is two to three. And the perfect fourth is three to four. And so it's one to two, two to three, three to four, one, two, three, four. Um, then uh, the assumption is that what we're perceiving is the underlying beauty of the mathematical relationships. That was the way the ancient Greeks approached it. And so therefore, uh, you could create a building that has windows of size one to two, two to three, for example, so they get bigger as you go down the, the, the different stories in, that, in those proportions. Um, and if their assumption is correct, the building will be beautiful and people will say that it's, it looks right. Um, now, again, I can't prove to you that it does. It, it's, it, there's a lot of assumptions that underlie this. But what I would say is that the buildings that are built on those principles are the ones you see in Florence or in Oxford or in the center of our old cities that the tourists flock to. And whether they know it or not, that's what they're responding to. And I would say that architects today could um, learn a lesson from this, that they want to pro uh, create buildings that are popular uh, and beautiful. You know, I think uh, you, you know, you've come to, or you gave a talk at our house uh, uh, years ago, uh, and where you, and I've heard you talk other places, where you set out some pictures of, of different um, buildings and so i think in your book also you have like the brutalist architecture where all the yeah. all the windows look are the same size and then you get a number of buildings where where you see this this um proportion or ratio of window sizes and it's kind of interesting because this brings us back around to where where you were when i when i interrupted you and told you to, to stop for a second about aristotle <laughs> is that you you said you know look if you can't see this i can't really help you i mean there's a yeah. certain point <laughs> where and I think you use the consensus example is that people visit Florence, Oxford over time, over centuries, and that pe people respond to this type of, 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 of order and harmony and proportion. And that it's a reflection, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it's a reflection of nature, of a mathematical uh, truth. And that there's, at, at some point, it's maybe what you could call, maybe this is the wrong word exactly, but it's a, it's, a, it's a type of intuition that you intuit, this is ordered, this is harmonious, I like it. And as you say, if you, if you can't see it, then you can't see it. Um, and, and, but if we look at consensus, if we look at time, we look at history, most people can. So let's begin there. And now I'm back to this place where you were, and this is where Aristotle begins, right? So why don't you, why don't you proceed from, from there? Now let's assume okay, we can kind of see that there's harmony and proportion and, and we can debate that more, but let's move forward because I think from this Aristotelian beginning that we see some sense of order, it starts to give us some insight into what things are pleasing when known, right? Which is Aquinas's definition of beauty. It, it pleases yes. us when it's known. Um, and so there are these, Aquinas has these three categories, but the thing to, again, to remember is that these are analyses after the fact. You, mm -hmm. you it, it, it's uh, it's looking at the pattern of what people find beautiful and saying these are common elements, but all the parts are in right relation to each other. So that's what I was describing. And so that's due proportion um, and due meaning appropriate. So it's appropriate to what it is. A cow shed is not proportioned in the same way as a palace. Um, and I, that there's lots of elements of judgment here. We just pick this, the architect will use his judgment. We perceive it. And, you, and when you have something that is built like a palace but acts like a cow shed, we, we feel that it's wrong. And they, they, delit, they d built things like this in English stately homes so that they could have a building on the horizon. You had a beautiful view that looked like a painting, um, a sort of a, 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 a classical painting. Um, 
and they called them follies because people knew that they were wrong. You, you, you get to it, and it was smaller than you thought it was, and the cows were, were living in it. Um, and so uh, you can't have a gilded, gilding the lily is, is the phrase. You, know, you can overdo it. Um, but So that's due proportion. Um, then it must have um, integrity. In other words, the, the, the thing as a whole must be a must be seem as though it's uh, connected to a purpose, and so the parts within each other within it are related to each other properly. That's due proportion, and then the whole is properly related to what it is. In other words, we have to be a, we have to have a sense and knowledge of what it is we're looking at, um, and so and that's the that gives us the third category, which is called clarity which is that we can perceive this clearly. If it's just in a black hole, we can't tell whether it's beautiful or not. It, it relies on a relationship between a, an observer and the person who is observing. This is the, the thing about beauty. And one of the definitions is the radiance of being. Uh, it tells us what it is. And this is the amazing thing about the universe, is that it tells us about itself, that we are made to respond to it. And all things um, in a properly ordered world have a purpose which uh, is related to the purpose of all things, which is the end is God. In other words, we talk of things being teleological, that they will have the, the purpose for which it's made, which may be, may be something very something mundane and ordinary, or it might be noble in human terms. But ultimately, all of these things will have their true place in a world which directs us towards the creator, who is the, the inspiration of man's creation and ultimately the creator of all things. And so that property of integrity uh, relates the thing to its purpose. And we have an innate sense of that. And this um, connects us, therefore, um, to uh, the utility of beauty. And, and we mentioned this when we were talking uh, before we started recording, right. that mm -hmm. a lot of people say that um, w when that utilitarianism um, is not interested in beauty, um, and that we need to get past that and recognise that there is something more than utility. I would say no. Um, I would say that um, that you that beauty really does have a utility, and that is that when you take into account the fact that we are made by God to seek him and to see him in all that is around us, um, then um, when you take into account man's soul, in effect, then that is what beauty is doing. It is nourishing our souls, and it is allowing us to recognize the purpose of all things and point to God. It's actually, uh, beauty is uh, something that uh, is a pattern within it which points to the future. Um, in contrast to a, a scientific analysis, which looks at the pattern within it and tries to discern the past, efficient causes, as the philosopher would say. So beauty is teleological. It, it connects us to where we're going. And this is why we delight in it. And furthermore, Benedict XVI talks about this. He talks about being wounded by beauty. He quotes the church fathers. And this is Plato too, right? I mean, this is like the, yeah, being wounded, yeah. yeah? Exactly, that it goes right the way back to uh, the early philosophers, that we, we, we delight in something that's beautiful, but it, it creates in us a longing for what it points to. And we would say it's a longing for God. Now, all objects can participate in that. Um, and when you uh, consider the people who built, for example, the, Goth the Gothic cathedrals, they believe this. Mm -hmm. And so... They thought that the beauty of it was so bound up in the uh, fullest sense of the purpose of what a, a cathedral is, not just its function as a building, but its function as something which houses the liturgy and to which we respond as people um, and are, are searching for God, that they would say that the most tr beautiful object is the most utilitarian, if you like, or most mm -hmm. useful even in, in the reduced sense of utility, that it's a sign of a true utility. You know, it's Apple versus uh, PC. <laughs> that there's something in that thing. We're attracted to it. 
And it has a premium. People want this because they are deep down, they're responding to this. So, okay, I have a couple of questions for you here um, and, yeah. and a couple of comments. So, but I want to go back to this response to things because it also uh, it will lead us into the questions of why beauty is important and also what about ugliness. But um, sometimes I'll describe it this way and maybe this is a good, maybe your comment is a good, is a correction. To, I'll sometimes describe that one of the, one of the signs of personhood, our reason, a manifestation of our reason, our freedom, uh, one of them is that we are able to create art. And I'll sometimes say that doesn't necessarily have a use, but it has deep, profound meaning. Um, and people don't, sometimes they don't like that. What do you mean art's not useful? And I have to say, well, I don't mean it's not at all useful. I mean that it actually goes beyond use into meaning. But maybe what you're, you're saying is maybe that's a false dichotomy. Maybe it's better to say that, that meaning, if we're a certain kind of being that, that seeks after meaning, that beauty, experiences of beauty, order, harmony, proportion, integrity are not simply, are not just meaningful. They're actually useful to us. I mean, is this a, or, or are they, are they overlapping? That's the first question I have. And then I have a, one more. Yes, yeah, so I'm not arguing at all with your description of the um, the importance. Well, of maybe yours things. is better. I mean, that's. A, I mean, go ahead, feel free. <laughs> I, I I do think it's a false dichotomy, though. I, mm -hmm. I think that um, I think we're conceding ground to the opposition in in trying to add something to utility. I say I think we should go straight on the attack and say no. You you're not recognizing the the, the human person fully. Um, this. This is useful. This is good. It has value. And furthermore, it even has monetary value if you want to get right down to brass tacks. People will pay a premium for this because they they, they desire it. They want it. Um, and none of this diminishes uh, the, the nobility of beauty, of, of the idea of it. So they're not mutually exclusive. They, they can be both meaningful but also useful to us as persons, right? Embodied persons with reason and freedom. That's what you're saying. It's it's both. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So another thing, it's interesting that you pointed out, uh, and I'm going to ask you about Plato and Boethius, who are, are very um, influential in your thinking. But it's interesting that you, it's kind of, I've thought about it a couple times as you've talked. And, and this is St. Bonaventure's idea of semiotic metaphysics, which seems to be underlying some of your things. And if I've got Bonaventure uh, right, from if I remember it correctly. So for Bonaventure, everything in the world is a vestige of God. And then human beings are in the image of God. And then human beings in grace are, are returned to the likeness of God. Right. right. But that in this image, everything for it, there's, there's a signed metaphysics. That is a tree is a tree in itself. It's also a sign pointing to God. And um, <clears throat> this seems to be kind of a, a part of your understanding of, of beauty of nature and also, I think, connected to the idea of, of usefulness, that it's useful, if you want to use a broad term of use, that the tree is a tree. It's also useful that the tree is a sign pointing to God. So it seems, I mean, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bonaventure's kind of semiotic metaphysics, but that seems your, your vision of the world, which is clearly non-materialist, which I like since I'm not a materialist, uh, <laughs> is, it has this sign element to it. And that seems to be part of your understanding of the usefulness of beauty uh, that you, you think that maybe we're conceding. Yes, uh, it is. So, um, I, I mean, I hadn't come even come across the phrase semiotic metaphysics before. So that uh, if that's what it is, then that's what I believe. Yes, I would say so. So we're both learning things then. All yeah, from yeah, Bonaventure yeah. though. <laughs> but, but the other- Not original. The, the culture of man, of course, man can um, participate in this, and he can do it well or he can do it badly. Um, and but when he does it well, the glory of the culture that man creates can exceed that of the natural world through God's grace. Not only do we interact with nature so that we raise it up and make it more beautiful, but the, the things that man creates, in principle can be more beautiful than the most beautiful sunset um, because through God's grace, we can, uh, we can contribute to the beauty of, uh, of the cosmos mm -hmm. in that way. 
Um, and we are in ex an extraordinarily privileged position. We can mess it up as well, of course. We can do right. it very, very badly. We have evidence of both, I think, in the culture of math. Right. I mean, that's right in, in Genesis. Um, you know, a lot of the commentators, Jewish and, and, and Christian, comment on the fact that in the creation, man is... Um, called to participate with God, to complete creation, to raise it up, to lift it up. Yeah. And we do that um, uh, in, in mundane ways through our work, uh, yeah. but as which that are important. When I say mundane, I don't mean not important. Yes. And, and then uh, also through great um, acts of, I think, beauty that point to, to, to the deeper, I'd say what, what I like C.S. Lewis calls the deeper magic of, of, reality that and and also point yeah. to, and, and point to to god so let me let me uh, go uh, to ask this question then so you talk about we like beauty we pay for beauty we want beauty and i think i mean i think this is and actually it, it's an, a good argument um it's almost kind of empirical a little bit right uh it says look i mean look around look at the reaction of human beings uh look at how over time we react to certain things that that means there's meaning there. Um, yet at the same time, we also produce a lot of ugliness in art and people will pay for ugliness. So I'm um, Roger Scruton in, in, in an essay uh, called, I think it's called faking it. Uh, it kind of critiquing neo-expressionism, I believe in some of the other modern abstract arts and said, look, the whole thing is, it was a, was a, a ruse. Like people would paint this terrible stuff. Um, I think it was Clement Greenberg was the art, was the critic would mm. would write about it and then a lot of people you know rich people would spend a lot of money on it but but it was all kind of a a, a ruse right uh, there's yeah. a play i saw in london actually called art years ago um uh and where did you, did you see it where this man yeah yeah it's, it's, it's very clever it was one fr guy buys a painting a white canvas with white stripes and i think he pays like a hundred thousand pounds for it and um <clears throat> he's telling his friends and one of his friends thinks it's okay and the other friend's like well have you lost your mind right and there's this <laughs> debate like this ruse so uh there's two questions i mean one is what about say certain types of say neo-expressionist stuff that maybe you wouldn't say has harmony or proportion or radiance but at least and most people don't like but some people are paying a lot of money for that's the first question and then the second question of ugliness what about one of the critiques of modern life that people buy ugly, terrible, kitschy stuff? Um, how, how do you, so the, the first one maybe is easier to respond to. Let's start with the first one. Uh, what about, you know, kind of very high, refined, modern, contemporary art that almost nobody likes, but still people make a lot of money out of? And then we'll go okay. to the second one. What about kind of vulgar, kitschy stuff that people are also making millions out of, both of them would be, well, the second one especially would be an argument against your consensus uh, yes. is good. It's probably, yeah, so people commonly produce it. Okay, so uh, the great, the first point is that the great, vict uh, the great um, sort of success of the uh, gallery art world, the contemporary art world, is that they've convinced people to suspend their judgment. Uh, that if you don't see that as good, that's your problem. You're not one of the elite uh, Gnostic seers uh, of the art world like me, Clement Greenberg, or whoever it is. Uh, and, and people will believe that, and they flatter those who buy it. Um, and it's as simple as that. So that they're also, and they may even convince themselves that they like it. And it, as we know, if, if you, um, if you are exposed enough to country music, you'll end up liking it. That's a joke, by the way. I'm, I'm... <laughs> I like country music. I, I admit it. That, <laughs> that goes to my second question. Um, I, I play I play the banjo, I should say, after my trip to uh, first trip to the U.S. And I came back playing the banjo. My friends in England just said, thank goodness you didn't go to Indy. You'd have come back playing the sitar. <laughs> but the, the point is that we, we, we do start to like what we're familiar with, good or bad. Um, mm -hmm. And when you've got money and flattery and pride involved as well, um, and people who are manipulators, then you can get anybody to do anything in the short term. So that's the first one. You know, that speaking of the moral imagination uh, and, and the importance of reading good stories, I mean, that's the emperor has no clothes, right? This is a, a yeah. kind of classic, classic example that, um, and also the danger of propaganda, which I think is a, a, a larger topic what I won't, that I won't address here, but hopefully on other episodes. Um, this real problem of propaganda. People are propagandized. So I'm not pushing back that hard because I kind of agree with you, but 
let me try to push a little bit and say, well, okay, I mean, that's great, but it seems like a cop-out. I mean, the facts are, these are, these are the leading artists. They sell their paintings for incredibly high price tags. Uh, they're written about by all the leading art critics. I mean, what makes you, who tends to like more traditional things, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, isn't it? I mean, isn't that a little bit of an easy argument? I mean, what is there? Is there something else you would say? How else would you respond to somebody who pushed back on you? I mean, again, part of it, like I, I, I'm being honest, I, I actually find it. Um, I, I I agree with you. I mean, I went to an, an exhibition of uh, neo expressionism, and, and I thought that it was a disaster. But but I mean, no, but uh, you know, maybe I'm just a philistine. Maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, here's what I would say, and uh, this does bring us into popular culture to introduce that subject, is that time will tell. I might be wrong. Maybe those neo-expressionists are objectively beautiful. Um, and the, but the, we will know when in 500 years' time they're still being talked about and uh, they have a, a popular appeal. I would say that those that the mainstream art world if you ask most people what they liked and you presented them with a range of 10 paintings, very few would go for the, 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 the art that you're describing, um, even today. And I always use the, um, the dinner party scenario. You have eight people around the table in your sort of standard dinner party uh, size, um, and the subject of art comes up. You have one arty person who argues in favour of what's in the Tate Gallery, you have me passionately arguing against it. And then you have six people who are shrugging their shoulders and saying, I don't really understand it. That's funny. I just wrote a note to myself saying, I don't understand it. Because yeah. I was, I was yeah. going to bring that up that you said it. Sorry, I'm inter interrupting. But I just wrote, I don't understand it. Because I remember I was at, a, at an event and I saw, oh, I don't really understand art. And I, I thought to myself, yes, you do. It's ugly. And you yeah. know it's ugly, but you don't want to be embarrassed just in case, yes. right? And if you push them and say, well, what do you like? They say, well, actually, I like that. And they will point to the traditional stuff, usually. Right. Which um, goes to your kind of consensus point. So let, how about, okay, so, yeah. well, we'll um, I mean, you know, some people will like this, some people won't. But let's, let's, let's move forward um, and go to, how about um, kitsch and, uh, well, I don't know if kitsch is fair because that's kind of a crazy, let's, let's talk about just kind of ugliness, right? I mean, so let me let me say, I don't mean country music, for example. I mean, you may think, I mean, I think a lot of modern country music is I, not I, as good. I was joking. I, I oh. like Appalachian folk. Though, yeah, no, no, I no, I know. I mean, a lot of modern stuff isn't, I don't think, is good. Contemporary stuff isn't as good. But I think some of country music, I mean, there's something that appeals like, I mean, this is kind of traditional folk type of music, Appalachian, Irish, yep. Celtic music yep, yep. that has an appeal to the heart. I mean, it's part of a folk tradition. Uh, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about that. I mean, this goes back to your point, like, you don't always have to listen to Mozart or Bach all the time, right? You, yeah. you can take pleasure in something more simple than that. I think there's a, yeah. a real value in folk tradition. So what I'm talking about is kind of like mass-produced ugliness. Um, okay. That's, that's vulgar. I mean, people say, well, am I like, you could make the 500-year point on it, but still, it still kind of puts a little bit of a hole in your consensus theory. How, how would you respond to that? Well, I would, I would say two things. First of all, that I, I do have faith that the best rises to the surface generally on the whole. You, you can hide anything in the short term, um, and you, you can get mass hysteria. You know, even Hitler was voted in. So you, know, the, the, you could always create a sort of uh, crowd mentality which can promote anything in the short term. Um, and so you can, you can uh, create hype and fashion. But on the whole, the best rises to the surface. And and when people talk to me about popular culture and say, isn't it just the lowest common denominator? People don't have any taste. How are we going to, do we have to educate the whole world to do this? Uh, and I say, no. What that says is that Christians are, are, have, have just, uh, are not taking responsibility for creating popular culture. What it says to me is the vacuum is tremendous. That if we could create art and music, uh, um, not just at the highest level, but at the, at the superficial, which has its place, as I, as I said, um, that, that spoke in some way of the beauty of the cosmos, they would clean up. Hmm. Um, everybody likes to, you know, I've just been to a wedding reception, for example, 
and and everybody's there dancing away, and that's gr- good, healthy stuff. And um, there'll be some of that music which will last. You know, we'll, we'll be listening to in five hundred years' time. I would say um, some we won't, um, and we just don't know what it's going to be. But on the whole, Christians could be should be involved in this, engaging with it, and you can have. Um, the superficial, which is nevertheless beautiful and appropriate to what it is. You might not use the word beautiful for just sort of a, something that gets you on the dance floor at a, at a wedding reception, but it, 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 technically it is. And so I, I, this is really saying that, that, that Christians need to be there and, and uh, pr- producing better stuff. If you look at Hollywood, for example, the film industry, um, in the past, uh, films really did promote uh, good messages, and those that do tend to be popular. And even if they're not hyped by the studios, these are the ones that gain ground eventually, that they will gain sort of cult status. But on the whole, overtly Christian films are just a disaster. We're doing so badly. We don't understand how to communicate messages through the popular culture in the way that the, the cultural Marxists do, for example. And so we've got to get our act together. And, and if we did that, I would say that, that people are so desperately thirsting for something that they can relate to, it would, it would rise straight to the top. Now, the other thing, just to point um, to this thing about the, uh, the fashion and ugliness, they, every now and again in Britain, at least, they have these polls on uh, what are the best pop music tunes in the history of man. Okay, so... That means going back to probably 1950. And I remember when I was back in England once, they had they had one of these polls. And so you'd have the Beatles and maybe Stones, perhaps a Led Zeppelin or something like that. And so these are things that have lasted over the 50 years. Six out of the top 10 were by one band that had had six number one hits in the previous year. That band was called Bros. B R O S. Okay, they were voted as, as as having six of the all-time greatest pop tunes that that had ever been created. One year later, there was a their fall from grace was so dramatic. There was a joke going around: knock knock, who's there? Bross, Bross, who? That's show business. And so okay. the the point about this is that everybody's forgotten who they are. They wouldn't get into the top fifty now, and. The answer is, even amongst popular culture, we may be surprised at what actually um, appeals and what lasts. Eric Sarty is a composer, for example, who was derided in his day, the French composer. And even if you, if you don't know who he is, I bet you would know his tunes. Uh, it's used all, they're used all the time. Hauntingly beautiful and very simple uh, tunes written for the piano, generally. Uh, and Debussy and Ravel used to make fun of him. Um, but he's probably his tunes are probably more well known now than Debussy and Ravel, I would say. Hmm. So I want to I, before I, I, let's in a little bit. I want to ask you actually about how we can people can learn to to create more. How, how do we how do we go about learning? I, I, but I want to go. But I think because you brought a couple of things there that I want to I actually want to address. But I want to ask you a couple more maybe more theoretical questions uh, first. Um, but one of them that came to mind as you were talking. Um, is the and I think it's maybe related the the sensibilities. How do we how do we improve our taste, if you want to call it that? How do we improve our yeah. sensibility to beauty? I remember once I was teaching undergraduates and I, and I said they hadn't really listened to any orchestral kind of classical music, orchestral music, and they listened to pop all the time. And I said, well, do an experiment if you can. It'll be hard, but try it. Why don't you not listen to any pop music? for just a month and only listen to orchestral classical pieces right? and see what happens. And I don't think very many of them did it. They tried a little bit, but some, I think at least one person did and others, I think, talked to me about it, that all of a sudden, the popular music that they thought was so interesting and compelling became a little bit boring to them. It didn't have the same power that it did before listening to Kind of class, what you what you call classical orchestral music, you know, romantic, classical, baroque, um, and as they began to listen to this more complex music, all of a sudden the the uh, kind of shine of pop music fell off, 
And so that, and I thought that was, and that happened to me too. I mean, I mean, I remember I threw away over a hundred CDs because I think they were corrupting my intellectual moral life, but that's for another time. And, uh, and I, as I began to listen to more serious music, pop music, rock music became boring. It wasn't, it was like, well, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's like an Oreo cookie, right? Yeah. Okay. I can have it for like, but I don't want a package, just one Oreo cookie. Like I can listen for a couple minutes and now I'm done. Um, do you think, uh, what do you think about this, this idea? I mean, maybe it's wrong. What do you think? That, that, that there is a sense where we have to um, uh, increase our sensibility to beauty, and that has to do also with exposure to more beautiful things, which I think is related to your point that we're not making enough beautiful things. But uh, what do you think about that? Yes. Well, it's certainly true that, that tastes can develop, uh, and the more we see beauty, the more the true beauty, the more we like it. Um, and so um, it is good for people in their education to be exposed to beautiful things. That, of course, then you need educators to develop a canon of beauty. Immediately, you, you have the elites doing that, and uh, you have people fighting for control of the canon. Um, and at the moment, the Marxists have it. So, you know, you we're in trouble in our public schools, for example, and our universities. Um but yes, that, that, that it's certainly true that taste can be developed. And the, the question then, though, is we've got a pretty big job of education on our hands, if that's the case. Are we really saying we're going to have to educate the whole world? And, and I think that the answer is no. The people we should focus on are those who are interested in creating beauty, the composers, the artists, the writers, the architects. They're the ones who should be. We should focus on primarily in developing that taste, so that they can create beautiful things. And then, then their job is to do the hard work for for the masses, if you like, to create uh, things that connect with people today that are beautiful. So some of that superficial pop music, a lot of it sends you in the wrong direction, but some of it sends you into the inner rings of the onion, if you see what I mean, that has God at the center. So some of it engages us at the surface, uh, but it creates a momentum, a desire for something a little deeper and a little deeper. And then we might go through classical music. And then uh, then eventually you might get to liturgical music and polyphony and then ultimately chant, for example. And I think that we that all of these levels of culture have a place to play, and all should be uh, working together. And we need people who are composing at every place in that um, that a, a range of different aspects of the culture. Um, and then I think people will be drawn naturally towards it. Uh, that that it's interesting, for example, that when you the popes have made pleas for beauty, uh, John Paul II's letter to artists, for example. Um, it wasn't to educate people to like beauty. It wasn't a letter to educators. It was a letter to artists. The artists need to be creating the art today that is going to stimulate people um, to in, and uh, stimulate that facility within them to recognize what is beautiful and set off that momentum that ultimately leads us to God perhaps through these stepping stones of more noble aspects of the culture uh, by degrees. So let me ask a couple of questions there. Um, I was hoping we could talk about intuition, but maybe we won't have time. So let me ask, let me, let me follow you here on this for a minute. So um, it see, correct me if I'm misunderstanding you, but it seems like one of the things you're trying to say, and you're using, say, we need Christians to be artists, um, which I think is true, but it, it seems that you're, you're, you, but you're not, you're not saying we need, we, we need necessarily religious art. Now you do iconography, you do icons, so you do religious art, but you're also arguing, well, we don't just need religious art. What we need is people, and you said broadly Christians, or let me, let me even back it out. People who don't accept a materialist worldview or yeah. a morally relativistic worldview who yeah. believe in some kind of truth, beauty, and goodness that's real and that there's moral truths and that human beings are, are not simply matter and, and that there's a way to human flourishing, that the more artists who have this broader, or I say maybe deeper worldview and are less materialist, not, not simply focused on, say, pleasure or acquisition 
or, or uh, freedom as merely radical liberation, but have a deeper understanding of what it means to be a human being, the more people creating art with that understanding, the better it's going to be. Because that art is yes. going to pull, pull people in to deeper things instead of pushing them, them out. And so if I understand you, you're not saying, first, let me just maybe, this is maybe yes or no, but you're not simply saying we need more religious art, right? Well, I am saying that we need more and better religious art, but I'm saying as well as that, we need all this additional stuff that right. you're describing. Okay, so we need, Otherwise, right. no one will see the religious art. Right, so we need both religious art and yeah. what you'd call broadly secular art, not secularist yes. art, but secular art. Okay, yeah. uh, uh, or, you know, profane versus sacred. All right, so um, it's, and I'm again, this is kind of a question, but it seems like at the core of this is really even back to the first things you began to talk about is whether our view of the cosmos of the world is one that the world and human beings have meaning and a purpose or not. And that the kind of dominant strain is not necessarily between Christians and non-Christians, but between those who believe that the universe has meaning and purpose and those who don't. And yes, um, what do you think? I mean, what, I, I don't know if that's, I'm well, still working I, I this out trying to understand. It's, it's, yes. It's not going to be exclusively, I'm a Catholic, so it's not going to be exclusively Catholics. It's not going to be exclusively Christians. There are many people who can contribute to this, but it's not just that it has meaning and purpose. It's the question of what is the purpose? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to have right. some sort of, consensus on the, 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 what that purpose is and that it's good. And ultimately, I think that means that it is a reflection that the, the cosmos bears the thumbprint, the mark of the one who created it. Mm -hmm. And it is made for us so that we might have a sense of the creator through his creation. And that art, what you're saying, is has to participate. That's the human participation yes. in also, like if you go back to this Bonaventure's term of semiotic metaphysics, yes. art also is a sign. Yes. Sa a pointing to the dignity of the person which points ultimately to the creator. Yes. And, and even if it's decorative, that, that, that has a purpose. <laughs> it, it makes a place habitable. It makes it delightful. Um, and it, it enables us, it helps us to see how even the, you know, the, the most mundane place can be in some way speaking of God and God's inspiration. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, both of our mutual friend, Carrie, Carrie Gress has a new book uh, called the theology of home, where she oh. addresses this, this very, this very question that the home also has to be a place of beauty. If there's a theological um, meaning to, to how you decorate the home. Uh, it's quite, yes. Quite wow. Cool. Okay. Fantastic. <clears throat> oh, if you haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. It's just coming out. So you'll have to see it. All um, right. Yeah. So, um, so how then do you think, what's a way forward for people to learn how to do art in, in, in an appropriate manner that takes all these things seriously? Because you said, we've talked about this, it's, you're not just saying go back and do old things over, but actually do new things that appeal to people in the contemporary world, but part of a tradition. And I know you're, of course, doing work at Pontifex University and the Way of Beauty, and you're training a lot of people, uh, both in art and theology. And I agree with you that we need more Catholics and Christians in the arts and in the sciences. And I think even before the theological question, we have something to offer because we take the universe as having meaning and it's intelligible to us. Um, but And then, of course, when you add the theological elements that, in fact, the art and the sciences don't simply point to themselves, but but point uh, to God. Um, yet a lot of people would say, "Well, how, how do I go about that? How do I become? How do I? I mean, the, if I want to study art today, it's kind of dominated by secularist positions. Um, you said by Marxism, uh, by by radical materialism, by understandings of of freedom that's merely like radical liberation. How does someone go about training oneself or to be an artist, to do new things, not just old things, but to do new things, yet taking, like receiving from the tradition? What would you tell someone? Well, I, what, you, what I would suggest is that you immerse yourself in a, in a tradition. So you decide what, you, what it is you, you like, um, and then you, you 
so we're talking here about art. So let's use the example of painting, for example. Um, if you uh, like Baroque art, then you you have to learn the skills. And there are still places. You, I wouldn't go to one of the mainstream universities. There are places around that teach you the skills of drawing and painting. Uh, they, they will be called ateliers, which is a French word for workshop, and they teach the academic method, for example. Or you can do iconography classes uh, where you teach iconography. But what I would do is um, immerse yourself in, in a tradition which you're drawn to um, and then become a master of it. And the goal is to learn how you um, adopt a style as your own. So when people learn to paint uh, in a particular way, they copy the old masters with understanding. Uh, they also paint directly from life. Um, and then uh, once you're a master of one, in one of those traditions, you can then start to look at the culture around you and start to recognize the good and the bad and start to discern how to incorporate things into it that will then speak to the modern world. And so if you want a little example of how this was done, uh, Baroque artists in the 17th century, missionaries, Jesuits, went to China and they noticed that uh, Chinese landscape painting, that, that it was in many ways compatible in its outlook with the, the Christian understanding, but it had its foundations in, a, in Taoist principles, but it was compatible with the Christian understanding of the, the world around us. And so they set about, as master Baroque painters, drawing in uh, the, the aspects of Chinese painting that were compatible with it. And then they turned it around and spoke to Chinese and Japanese people as missionaries. And so that's what you do. You become uh, immersed in our traditions. So it's, you, you will need to do some study, uh, also spiritual formation. Um, and then you start to look at the, the culture around us and you draw things in discerningly. Um, again, this is what the artists did in the early years of Christianity. They looked at Greek and Roman culture. They rejected the, ga the, the bad and retained the good. Okay, that's that's very helpful. I think I think that's a, the so the, you're 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 not simply doing again what was done, but you're taking from this kind of stream of tradition in the context in which you find yourself, and then talking to that very context. Because really, I think the the problem of our say, I mean, like we talked about materialism, and then I uh, um I want to move to a, a, another question. But I mean, one of the problems of our world is we live in a, in a material in a world where a lot of people have accepted materialism. I mean, you see, for example, you know, the some of the popularity of the, the new atheists and all this kind of materialistic, scientistic uh, ex trying, uh, attempts to explain the world um, don't necessarily lead to happiness. They they really create a, a, a life devoid of meaning. People are struggling. So, if you're going to create modern art, that's going to pull people into first to understand that the world has meaning and then hopefully to uh, the one true God, you you have to speak to them where they are. And Gregorian chant's not going to do that. Well, Gregorian chant might. Well, might, yeah, sorry. New, I, that, that, I mean, new, yeah. new composition as well as the, the canon of things. And the liturgy is slightly different because the liturgy Right. It's a separate world that is the source of its own culture, if you see what I mean. Yeah, that was probably so, a bad example. I guess what yeah. I mean, I, that, was just, that was just like a some like a, a art that may have done it two centuries ago or five centuries ago may not do it now, is the point. Yes, yeah, cer certainly not once you get outside the church. You, right. you need to be more conservative in the church, I would say. Okay. Um, but, the, the, but the problem is that you have then people looking at Matisse, for example. You had these French Dominicans. Yep looking at the, the artist Matisse. For the chapel. And, yes, but doing this undiscerningly. That, that Matisse, it, he was um, a modernist. who was pro His work, the style of his work, the form of what he did, was profoundly anti-Christian. And so you can't portray a Christian message through a vehicle which, just by the, the way in which it does it, um, speaks of values which are not Christian. Okay, why don't you explain that? Explain that. Why would you say Matisse is anti-Christian? I don't. I'm sorry. I don't mean he was anti-Christian. I mean, why did you say his art is is 
is anti-Christian. I mean, there's some beautiful color. He's sometimes pulling out, I mean, some of the, I mean, I'm just saying you could say, well, you look at Matisse and you, you're you taken, his, his use of color makes you pay attention to the world around you in a way that you wouldn't earlier, right? So, so I, I would I why? would certainly acknowledge a beautiful use of color, um, and so I, I would certainly hire him to decorate my home. I'd do, I'd do that. Yeah, um, choice of paint, the color of the carpets, the color of the curtains. He'd be very good at that, I would say. And that's not um, you know, there's a, a use in that, um, but the the forms that. Uh, that he uses, the style which he uses, is deliberately rebelling against the tradition. And they rebelled against the tradition. So all the artists of this period, um, quite deliberately, because they associated it with the with the traditional Christ, Christian worldview. Um, and so they wanted to portray mankind in a way which denied the value of the body for example. So they, they emphasize the spiritual and, and the, in some sense, the dualist. So they tend to overly abstract and distort in a way that doesn't emphasize the beauty of the body, I would say. You see this particularly in Picasso. Right, Picasso. I, mean, um, I, think, I think we talked about Ian McGilchrist in his book, The Master and His Emissary. I think we talked about that before. Um, kind of deals, uh, addresses the, the issue of Picasso. But I think if you look at some of Picasso's works where like there's all these parts, there's not an integrated notion of the body, um, that, the, that it, it, it almost like affirms that a body is simply to be used and not integrate. There's not an integration of, of the soul and body. There's not an embodied person uh, there. Um, what about, so explain to me though, let me keep going on this. I, I mean, I, I stopped you here for yeah. a second, but ex explain to me. So you say, for example, the form and the style. And so you've given an example of Picasso. Please, please keep going with that. Matisse, okay, give so some examples how form and style were a repudiation of, of uh, say, a Christian worldview where there's, you know, truth and um, uh, there's a it, harmony between truth being and goodness, where the person is an embodied person, et cetera. C could you give some examples? Yeah. I think I think people yeah, are yes. they so, sense this, but they don't know how to articulate it. Okay, so if you look at Picasso in particular, um, he subscribes the idea of, that comes from I think from Rousseau, sort of two hundred years earlier, of the noble savage that civilization is the problem, that man is born good. And uh, if, he wasn't, if it wasn't for Western civilization, everything would be great. And so he had this idea of the noble savage. So what he tried to do was he rejected the tr traditional styles, which he associated with the Christian faith. And then um, he started to look around for styles that would promote the noble savage and uh, unrestrained emotion, um, especially the libido, of course. Um, and in, in a very patronizing Western European way, ironically, where did he go? Africa. So he looked at Nigerian traditional art, which he saw these sort of faceted shapes, and they, they based their cubist art on this uh, idea. They, they thought that it promoted the noble savage, man um, with an unrestrained, uh, um, no restraint on their emotions, um, and then the other thing, of course, is that the, the goal of the artist, again, under the originally the romantic influence, is self-expression. Mm -hmm. So even then, when Picasso paints a, a chair or Matisse paints a chair, they're not painting um, a chair. They're painting their own emotions expressed through the chair. And so effectively, they're inserting their souls into what they see around them. And, and there's a conflict here. And this is why you end up with this ever-increasing desire to abstract, to express emotion. At some point, it became clear to the artists themselves that they couldn't do this. And the, the, the clear test is, if you ask somebody uh, to look at a painting and say, what emotion is that? I mean, if you have lots and lots of distortion and ugliness, you might say anger or something like that. But you can't get anything very complex. And they realized there was a, there was a um, contradiction between me expressing my soul through, a, through a, a painting of something that isn't me. And so then what they did is you started to get abstract expressionism where you're trying to express pure emotion. 
Um, and you just end up in, in, in greater and greater error. Now, along the way, you can have things that are de decorative or in the abstract have pleasing shapes, but it's accidental to what's going on. You know, uh, Tom Wolf has an essay or a book called The Painted Word, yeah. where he, he, ad he addresses this. Like the only way you could understand what that possibly is is by reading the description of it. And of course, the description is just kind of made up. Uh, but so, so let's go back to self-expression because I did want to ask you about that. I mean, many people would say, I mean, this is pretty much a dominant concept of art right now, that art is in fact self-expression. Um, so what's wrong? Let, let's, okay, let's say, let's say, okay, we, ag we agree. Let's say, okay, I agree with you that taken too far, this notion of self-expression just becomes uh, absurd. But what about, what's wrong with Matisse painting his emotion, his experience of the chair? Is there, is there something wrong in itself? Or what, what's the problem with art as self-expression? Is there a limit? Is it kind of okay? At what point does it, like, what's well, the problem? Well, it, what I would say is that if the truths that the artist is expressing and believes in are objectively true, then it's not a problem. So even a broken clock is right twice a day. So occasionally you'll get the odd person who is sincerely Christian, for example, and is expressing Christian sentiments through uh, and through the what they're they're portraying. Um, now, but that isn't what self-expression generally means. Expression normally means uh, the accurate representation of what you're feeling, regard without regard to whether it's true or false, because there is nothing that's true or false. You just feel it's just feeling. Um, and then also without regard to the effect that it has on those who see it. So uh, if I <clears throat> um, actually express despair and loneliness, supposing I do that accurately, and then what I um, convey to those who view it is despair and loneliness. And as a result of looking at my work, they feel desperate and lonely, I would say that's not good art. The Christian uh, does uh, take into account human experience and the present of evil, but wants to convey the, the true context into which all this comes, which is there is hope that transcends it. Okay, but, that's what the Christian artist does. Okay, but back to that despair thing. I mean, wouldn't, <clears throat> couldn't you say, if you did a pretty accurate portrayal artistically of of despair and loneliness yeah and i saw it and it evoked in me despair and loneliness wouldn't that be a good work of art i mean i mean i'm not let me let me pause i don't i'm not saying like uh, therefore you should be despair and lonely your whole life i'm saying like you know sometimes you read a, a a wonderful novel or play or see a movie and at the end of it you're kind of uh, you're you it, it actually brings you into a sense of Maybe despair is the wrong word, but but loneliness or or sadness that is actually helpful because it connects you with the truth about reality, so that it's not the final word, right? The final word that there's hope, there's meaning, etc. I mean, explain to me. I mean, like if I'm saying like my like well, what's wrong with that? I mean, wouldn't that be good art? Wouldn't wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be representing something true about the human experience? And even like so, like, the, one of the cl the classic examples, right? So Shakespeare, for example, he teaches us that the wages of sin is death. I mean, tragedy has a place in art. Maybe it's not the final word, but it has a place in art. How, how do you how would you respond to that? What I would say is that if if um, it does not in any way allow for the connection, whether it's e even if it's just implicitly with the Christian worldview, which says there is hope, that tragedy is not the end, then it's bad. It may be done skillfully, but it's not virtuous. It, it, it's not good in the, an absolute sense. But can you have artists who doing beautiful work who aren't Christians? Yes. Even if they don't know it? Yes. So an example? Uh, well, the Chinese landscape painters, I would say. Everything that they thought about the landscape was compatible with the Christian, or, or much, should we say. What they thought about the world around them as Taoists was compatible with it, with, with Christianity. They successfully communicated that in a distinctly Chinese way. Um, and 
So therefore, a Christian can look at that and say, this is good. And those artists were good artists. Okay. Okay, well, that that's gets more and more complex. So I want to I'm going to move on because I, I don't we want to we don't want to take. No, it's good. I mean, it's a very, it's a complex thing. I mean, it seems to me, it seems to me, um, you know, I think there's objective beauty. I have problems with the idea of art as merely self expression. I mean, one of the big problems I have with art self expression is what if you have a really boring banal self you want to express? I mean, I don't I don't know if self expression is enough. I mean, to, for art. So I agree with you. I guess it's I'm struggling a little bit. Um, and I and I also agree with you about the problems of the form and style of some modern paintings. I think are 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 deeply problematic for some of the reasons you've given. But I guess what I'm what I'm where I'm I, I can't follow is that it seems to me the question of of art it is that like so I think I'm trying to remember Jacques Maritain makes this this point. I think it's art and scholasticism, right? Where you know, the, there's an artist as the artist and the artist as the man. And that the art, I mean, and if, this is kind of a combination of Aquinas, but the artist is doing an act, right? So it's an act of the, of the practical intellect, right? So it's in, the, it's in broadly in the realm of moral action because that's, that's where moral action is, the practical intellect. But not directed necessarily to the good, but to the beautiful. And, if, and, and of course, for Thomas, as we know, they're transcendentals of the true, the good, and the beautiful. I mean, if, if an artist is making an act of a, a creation directed toward the beautiful and the true, even if that thing is despair and loneliness, because, right? I mean, maybe despair is the wrong word because despair is a different thing. But like, uh, even if he's re representing that the wages of sin is death, if there's representing um, tr some tragedy, it seems like whether he's a Christian or not, or has a Christian worldview or not, isn't isn't the de determining factor. Can you, no. Okay. It, it, it's quite possible that, you know, true is tr truth is truth, regardless of where it comes from. Mm -hmm. So there are many people who are not Christians who um, are able to paint and, and create things which are consistent in a, with a, a Christian worldview. Okay. So it has to do more with, like, a, like whether, whether the art is aligned or not with... What we could, let's call for now objective reality. Um, yes. Um, and so, and that, let, let, so let me, maybe let's tell me if you think this is right or how would you react to this? So, Picasso, in his, some of his paintings that really show women really in, as parts, et cetera, right? It's kind of like this distorted image of women is perhaps a reflection of Picasso's own distorted image of women. So it's self-expression because perhaps maybe Picasso sees women merely as parts to be used. And secondly, and this goes, to, I think, to your point, but push back if I'm wrong. Secondly, the viewer is, who sees the, the art is encouraged, is probably the wrong word, but it see, is also seeing the woman as parts. And this actually is a, is a, violation or uh, against being itself, right? So, so uh, let me put it this way. So what's, why, say, is lust said to be evil, right? Why is lust evil? Well, lust is evil because lust, a person I, looks at a woman, say a man looks at a woman, a man looks at a woman who's beautiful and he isolates her sexual values from her personhood. So she's all of her hopes and wants and dreams and fears, her own subjectivity, no matter, I'm just going to appropriate and separate her sexual values and turn her into an object, right, uh, for, for gratification or whatever it might be. Well, that's not the appropriate response to the person who is not simply an object to be used, mm. but a subject to be respected. And that's why, um, that's why it's a sin to lust. Now, obviously, it's also a, a prostitution, uh, a pornography, um, Right, these are also sins, of course. I, I, but I'm even talking about just like it, a, a, an act in the mind is nevertheless a sin because it's it's mentally treating a person as a thing when the person is not a thing, right? Yeah. And, and so, where if if the art b is both an expression, say, of objectification of, of of a person, and then encourages that type of thing, you'd say, oh, that's bad art because it's having these these uh, these negative effects. I mean that that I can. That I see. 
Um, but it seemed like you were saying, and may, maybe you are, I'm, I, that, that even if you're expressing, say, something tragic, that that too is a problem, even if it leads the person down for a moment into tragedy. Now, of course, it could lead the person all the way down and they'd give up. But for other people, it could say, oh, this teaches me not to do this. I'm going to change my life. Uh, okay. Down for a moment. No, I, I'm not. So, and again, the model here would be which I've used to illustrate this is Baroque art, which has um, a, a visual language of light and dark. And so it, it, unlike iconography, which focuses only on the heavenly, Baroque art um, acknowledges, even in its stylistic elements, the presence of evil and suffering. That's very important for Christians. We must do that. And the best way to... to acknowledge that is for people to communicate their personal experience of it usually because then that will be most convincing so i'm not arguing against that but what i'm saying is if all you do is communicate that without at least some equipping people in some way after that moment should we say to to go in the right direction then that's problematic because all mm. you're saying is there is suffering and in, in the end uh, you have to be you have to communicate to people as well the hope. Um, now, it may be done in conjunction with other works of art. The artist may be aware of the context in which he's going to be read is a greater context of hope. But usually then they will, they will create those connection points that even if it's just a slight upturn that send you looking in the right direction. So we must acknowledge evil and suffering. Um, it's a reality. I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. But the, the question is, it, it always imparts a momentum to the person who views it. You, you're not just left with the art. You then go somewhere. And ultimately, that momentum has to be towards God. And the context of these emotions, it's hope or it's faith. Okay, yeah, that, that's helpful. So um, <clears throat> well, I've taken a lot of your time. So thanks for, for this. It's been very interesting. And there's so many things we could, we could continue to discuss. Um, your book, The Way of Beauty, um, one of the things, maybe the final thing, just briefly, I thought it was very interesting in your book, uh, The Way of Beauty, you talked about um, the octave and you connected it to music. And so that we talked about music a little bit earlier, but you have this octave uh, and you also have in Catholic liturgy, uh, the octaves, right? So you have the first, you have the seven days, uh, you have the six days of creation and then the seventh day you rest. And then the eighth day, the resurrection, right? So the seventh is Shabbat for, for, for the, the Sabbath. Uh, that that um, the Jews observe as the holy day, and then um, with Christ's resurrection on Sunday, um, the eighth day and the first day become one. And it was interesting how you talked about, in a sense, like this the liturgy of like it's going up in a spiral. Could you explain yes. explain that idea uh, of of the church and the and the liturgy and the connection to number and and beauty? I thought yes. it was really. I, I thought it was very interesting because it helps you people think, oh, okay, this is actually part of a reflection of the cosmos. I mean, that's maybe the, the other thing is that, um, and Benedict XVI talks about this, that liturgy is not uh, simply man-made, but it's, 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 um, it's given to us by God, but it's also a reflection of the cosmos. So it's not an anti-material, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, the, the worship of God, but both in, 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 the, in Jewish uh, liturgy and in I mean, and in Catholic liturgy, in Orthodox liturgy, doesn't disregard the seasons, right? It doesn't disregard the cosmos. It it doesn't. It's not as if it's kind of disconnected from the world in which we live, but in fact is has a deep appreciation for matter, but recognizing that matter, the sun, the moon, are not gods. They're in fact created by God, and that we have this right worship. Uh, in, aligned with the cosmos. And this is a very important part, I think, of, of understanding liturgy. And you do this with the octaves and, and mathematics. Could you explain a little bit about the cosmological dimensions of liturgy? Yeah, so on, on the grand scale, of course, we, we follow the, the calendar, which is linked to the phases of the moon and the cycles of the earth going around the sun. Um, every time you celebrate a birthday, uh, we're celebrating how many times the Earth has gone round the sun since the day we were born, although we never think of it like that. Um, and it seems important to people. So it's, it's natural to us to think in these terms. Um, so within the octave, you have um, 
let's start with the musical octave, where if I mention that word, people would think of it. You have the, the, the seven notes in a scale. Each one is higher than the last. And then you get to the eighth, which is higher still. And somehow it has that connection. Everybody hears it between middle C and C eight notes higher, should we say, if you're just plonking out the white notes on the piano. Um, and so rather than thinking of this as a linear progression, it's, it's better to think of us going on a sort of vector shift, which is along and up and to the left as well, and tracing a helix that leaves, we've done one turn of the screw, if you like, where we've done one octave. And so we're going up and up and up. But somehow there's a relived experience. Um, and furthermore, that re the recognition of that is beautiful. You see that in the harmony of music, and everybody sees it across all cultures, across all people. That they hear that connection. Then in the pattern of living, uh, the whole world follows a seven-day pattern of living. Um, and uh, so it seems natural to man. And, and again, people have tried to, uh, to break from this. They did it during the French Revolution, and people just can't cope. Mm -hmm. um, were you, were you going to say something? No, uh, right. I mean, like trying to create the 10-day yeah. week and all that thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it just doesn't work. Well, I think this, so the podcast is called The Moral Imagination, right? And this is actually one of the things Burke, is the moral imagination, you know, comes from, from Burke. And one of his critiques of the French Revolution was this, that it was a disconnection from reality. It, he called it economists, sophists, and calculators, right? Who, who wanted to, this hyper-rationalism that we were going to disconnect from all tradition so much that we're going to start the calendar again. And of course, it failed because the calendar isn't, I mean, the, this kind of connection to the moon isn't just made up. There's, there's a moon, <laughs> and there, there's the cycles of the moon. And so these, these things are, are, are actually influential. But keep going, yes. please. Um, and so um, it, it's natural to us. So all societies, all cultures find this. But in regard to the Judeo-Christian culture, of course, we have the seven days of creation, and this becomes the pattern of our worship also that, lives, mm -hmm. that, that works in harmony with this. Um, and then for the Christian, uh, you have the eighth day of cre creation. The church fathers talk of Christ as ushering in the new age and the new covenant, uh, which is the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And so we sell worship on Sundays, which and Sunday is simultaneously the eighth day of the previous week and the first day of the next, just like in music. You have it's 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 somehow connected. So we're we're working on a weekly helical cycle. Which if we every every Sunday we get another push, which takes us round the next turn of the screw, and we go upwards to heaven. Then, even within the day, and the Bible is the source of this again. Traditionally, you have these occasion. You mark certain points of prayer that that. Uh, would begin in the morning with the rising of the sun, in the evening with the, the dropping of the sun uh, at, at dusk. Um, but according to the psalmist, and St. Benedict quotes uh, this in his rule, he says, the psalmist says, seven times a day we will praise you, O Lord, and once during the watches of the night we'll rise at midnight. So he then lists the eight uh, occasions when the psalms are sung. Um, and so... Uh, it's that pattern of seven plus one again, and that kind of propels us along the day. And even if I'm not praying all eight offices in the day, the church is on behalf of all mankind, and not just for Christians. We, the church is there for all people. And so it's, it's taking us through the day with prayer, uh, and there is that seven plus one. And so even the, 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 the book of Psalms itself, according to Thomas Aquinas, is structured according to this pattern. So Thomas Aquinas in his commentary says uh, there are 150 psalms, and these can be divided up into 70 plus 80. 70 is for the old covenant, 80 is for the new. So even the very structure in which the words are presented to us conforms to this pattern. Now, the assumption is that we are made by God to recognize this, and part of seeing the beauty of it um, is that we're recognizing these patterns naturally. And so, therefore, we can create the culture in that way. 
Uh, we can incorporate these patterns into our daily living, and we have, we do that even in this secular age, secularist age, as you you, you refer to it. Um, people aren't fighting to change the seven day week, um, but also as as Christians, we can in, um, embody this in different ways in all in virtually everything we do. Um, there are many more complex number uh, uh, arrangements than just the seven plus one and the octave. But I use that as an example to show how in the culture, in music, in the cosmos, in the pattern of living, in the secular world, and in the pattern of worship, you have a common thread which runs through them all and which comes from Scripture in Revelation. God, just in case we can't read the side, God tells us personally in Scripture that it's there. And so, you know, maybe we'll end end there, but I, I with the, just you, that seems... You talk about in your book the influence of of Boethius and Augustine, where the, these these ideas of numbers. I mean, you're not just making them up. I mean, this is part of the tradition. It's in the Jewish tradition and in the in the yes. in, the, in the Catholic tradition. Uh, just maybe a, a, just a quick summary of like the influence of Boethius and and these idea how these ideas of, of mathematical like kind of the beauty and order of the cosmos as an as a reflection of of the Creator and to pull into the creator and how, how that influenced you. Maybe, and also maybe if it, if it, if it did in your conversion, because you were, you were a non-believer and uh, studying uh, material sciences, physics at Oxford, and then you became a Christian and part, I mean, there's clearly a mathematical influence in, in the way you see, see the world. Maybe just a quick, I mean, that's a, a big question, but maybe you could kind of end off by telling us a little bit about yes. that. Yes, uh, well, uh, that, I'll, I'll deal with the last part first. As, as someone who is used to looking at the world mathematically and, and looking at it scientifically, I love the idea that there is a complementary sort of mathematics which looks forward to where we're going, um, as well as the scientific mathematics which reflects on the past. And I see these two as working together. Um and so the ancient and the modern, therefore, are complementary. Um, and I like that because I don't want to reject modernity at all. I, I, I want to build on it and inform it and add to it. I think there's so much that's good about the modern world that um, we tend to be dismissive of. And, and I think, no, no, there's a lot right. of good stuff here. No, I agree. I think that's it. it you, don't, you don't want to have kind of like a resentment nostalgia like oh things were better things are always good and bad and um, we're in the world we're in and um, there's yes. a lot of benefit i mean like i mean we could list an, on and on about the benefits of uh, that modernity has brought but there's also some some um emptiness there's also some brokenness i think in our rationality there's brokenness in our in our understanding of deeper meanings understanding what the person means and so yeah i agree i agree with you it's, this is not a not not a a rejection uh, but but a building upon and also a recovery, I would say. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. A recovery too. Um, now, with regard to discovering this, um, there, there's a, a few sources. So one, I came across people who were coming at it from his, an Islamic point of view, believe it or not, at the uh, Prince of Wales's School of Traditional Arts in London. Um, and so for them, they believed in the beauty of the cosmos. What they and they were universalists. They talked about all the great traditions being equivalent revelations from God. And so I don't believe that. But they they are the ones who first alerted me to this traditional mathematics of harmony and proportion, which was part of all architecture up until the 20th century in, in the West, um, and is virtually forgotten now. Um, but um Alongside this, I read um, The Spirit of the Liturgy by Cardinal Ratzinger. So even before he was became Pope Benedict XVI, mm -hmm. he talks of the, uh, the, the mathematics of beauty going all the way back to Pythagoras and saying that this reflects the pattern of the cosmos. And, and he uses a phrase which struck me that uh, when we recognize this, we have some insights into the mind of God, is what he says, the mind of the creator. And it was the uh, church fathers who looked at the works of the ancient Greeks and then drew this into the Christian tradition um, and then recognized this as part of the, the patterns of the liturgy and connected this to our worship as well. And particularly, uh, the, the, the influential people were Augustine and Boethius. Um, so that, that's 
what Benedict was saying. There are others too, actually. But um, particularly Augustine and Boethus, because they were so influential and their writings were known through the Middle Ages, whereas other writers were lost. Um, so Augustine, it's not so systematic, um, but, but he he endlessly, in his commentaries on Scripture, he's always referring to number. And so read anything, and he'll talk about the symbolism of number. Uh, that's the other great value that number have. It, that if you have something done seven times here and seven times there, then you're going to connect the two together. Now, you have to be careful. It might just be that the, the writer was commenting that there were seven events. It doesn't automatically mean there's a connection. But in our minds, we can make that connection. That's the special power of number. Boethius, um, still there are uh, translations available of his De, Arith De Institutioni Arithmetica and De Institutioni Musica. So books about music, books about arithmetic, in which he talks directly of these proportions, these numerical relationships, and particularly the one on arithmetic. He lists 10 proportions, and he says he got them from uh, Plato, Aristotle, and other notable thinkers, something like that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. He just bunches all the rest together. But um, now he's not, uh, he, he's philosophical. He's Christian, but he's not relating it to the Gospels directly. But he is a, uh, he's writing as a philosopher who is part of the Christian faith. And that, those, so those were all, those have been like very influential in your thinking. Yes. In your, oh, yes. Know. Yes. Well, David, thanks. This has been very interesting, uh, a really good conversation. Thanks so much for all your time. Uh, tell uh, everybody where they can find you, um, a little bit maybe just quickly about Pontifex University. Um, of course, your book, uh, The Way of Beauty. You have another book on the, the Little Oratory, is that what it's called, on, on, on prayer yes. and home? And then your, your most recent book, um, what's, the, what's the, on not the life? It's called The Vision for You. The Vision for my, You, thanks. My, my story in faith, but it's about this discernment of personal vocation, of meeting this guy who I described right at the beginning of the interview. Uh, so The Vision for You, um, and then The Little Oratory is the book on prayer in the home, which is a description of how families can pray with icon corners according to the patterns we've been describing uh, with a view to creating what we call the domestic church, a place that nourishes the, the faith in the family and might be um, part of this drive to evangelize the culture. The way of beauty is, is the, uh, the theory, which is for educators, um, and uh, all of these are on Amazon, by the way. The uh, extension of the Way of Beauty book is in uh, a program, the Masters, Masters of Sacred Arts, which uh, is a whole master's program, which is uh, I created for Pontifex University, which is at uh, all the W's, pontifex.university. And uh, we have a book coming out as well very soon on the nude in Christian art, in the light of John Paul II's Theology of the Body, um, in which, incidentally, I argue that he was far more conservative than uh, many modern commentators think. He wasn't giving license to artists to uh, paint everybody with their clothes off willy-nilly, if I can use that phrase. So that's coming out soon. Okay, good. David Clayton, thank you for your time, and thanks for joining the podcast. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure.